Okay, well welcome everyone. Uh, it's good to see such a nice crowd here. I want to begin uh, by thanking the Robert Strauss Center for putting on this event. The Strauss Center, as all of you know, is an interdisciplinary center here on campus that is providing for the entire university a basis for people from across campus, from the community, and from around the world to come together to study, research, write, and teach uh, on strategy, international law, and particularly on the relationship between the study of society, history, political science, and contemporary political affairs, and their relationship to contemporary policy. I think the Strauss Center is doing some of the most important work in this area. It's why many of us are here, and I want to make sure that we acknowledge the Strauss Center for making this event possible. It is my great pleasure as a fellow at the Strauss Center to introduce John Lewis Gaddis today. John Lewis Gaddis is a true representation of how what starts here changes the world. He was born in Tula, Texas, received an undergraduate degree at the University of Texas Austin, a master's degree at the University of Texas Austin, and a PhD at the University of Texas Austin. And his life has gone from there to Ohio University with a brief stop at the Naval War College to Finland, many other parts of the world, and then to Yale University where he is the Robert Lovett Professor of History and the trainer of so many of us in this field. In fact, the field of international history, the field of international relations has been transformed by John Lewis Gaddis in his scholarship, in his public presence, but most of all in his training of students. John Lewis Gaddis has written works that have redefined the origins of the Cold War, that was his dissertation at the University of Texas, by the way, redefined the ways we think about strategy in the Cold War, what I still would argue is the best book on American foreign policy in the Cold War, Strategies of Containment, redefined the entire narrative of the Cold War from beginning to end, his recent short history of the Cold War based on his life at Yale, and now redefined our understanding of George Kennan and the development of policy planning and strategy in the United States, in the Cold War, and in international affairs. John Lewis Gaddis has redefined those elements of the ways we think about the key parts of policy making and historical scholarship. He's redefined those elements by taking his work beyond the classroom. He's been involved with many endeavors, endeavors that involve policy makers the State Department, Defense Department, and the White House, and has been so awarded recognition for that. He has built other projects, such as the Cold War International History Project in Washington, D.C., that provides a basis for documentation and scholars from around the world to come together through these issues. He's been intimately involved with the MacArthur Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation's work in these areas. He has been an institution builder, taking scholarship from the classroom to society at large. And there could be no better person to speak to the Strauss Center than that. But most of all, most of all, John Lewis Gaddis is a great teacher. And I want to reflect on that just for a couple of minutes. I've benefited from this personally. And I've been inspired as a child to always remember how important teaching is. Three things I want to quickly say to completely embarrass John here. That's really the goal of my introduction. Uh, John Lewis Gaddis is someone who has taken students from all fields and from all political persuasions. He does not have a politics to his teaching. He instead has a rigor to his teaching. Second thing is that Gaddis always encourages his students to read broadly. He is not someone who trains students to do what he does. He trains students to build on what he does. And third, and most significantly, John holds himself to the highest standards. I have never, in the 20 years I have known him, never known him to arrive somewhere unprepared. I have never known him to arrive without something new to say. I have never known him to go into autopilot. John is someone always pushing himself as he pushes his students. And I remain profoundly inspired and profoundly honored to have had the opportunity to know John for 20 years and to now have the opportunity to bring him to the Strauss Center. Please join me in welcoming John Lewis Gaddis. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you um, all for coming. I want to just take a couple of moments to embarrass um, Jeremy, uh, who I have known for 20 years or so. I first got to know Jeremy when some kid who was a junior at Oxford on a year abroad came to me and said, would I do a tutorial? I think somebody named Inboden was there that same year, as I recall. Uh, 
And um, Jeremy and I um, were actually at three different universities together, the first of which was uh, Oxford, the second of which was Ohio, where I, which was my home base, where Jeremy came and did a master's degree with us. Uh, and then uh, at some point in 1997 or so, uh, I was being very quietly lured uh, from Ohio by Yale. And this was all uh, top secret stuff at the time. But I got a, a phone call from Jeremy who said that um, he had been accepted into the PhD program at Yale. And what did I think about the place? I mean, should he accept Yale over Harvard, for example, or the other uh, six or eight Ivies that had accepted him uh, at the time? And I said, uh, Jeremy, if you decide to go to Yale, there is something you should know, which is that I will be following you there. <laughs> and there was a moment of silence. He pondered that, and then he said, well, I guess I could live with that. <laughs> so um, Jeremy's career at Yale, as it has been since, was extraordinary, and Jeremy has himself done pioneering work in uh, redefining the nature of international history, the intersection of cultural and political uh, history, uh, the uh, advent of comparative multi-archival Cold War history uh, for uh, someone still as young as he is. His first book, The Dissertation, Power and Protest, is a field-changing work in many ways. And that same uh, record has been continued through his uh, subsequent works, um, the Henry Kissinger book, the new book on nation building that's coming out. And I'm sure it's going to uh, continue to be the case uh, for many books to come. I had the privilege this morning of spending three hours, although it really went so fast that it felt like uh, 30 minutes with uh, Jeremy's grand strategy uh, class. And it brought back old times uh, of how we used to do seminars. And part of the fun of teaching, which is the extent to which professors and teachers, or in this case professors and professors, can teach each other. And so I feel that I have learned an enormous amount from uh, Jeremy. I think it's extraordinary that uh, he has come to Texas. It's an extraordinary opportunity for uh, the University of Texas. Um, and I'm delighted to see him wind, back, uh, wind up back at this place. So this makes four universities, Jeremy, that we're, we have been together in one form or another. And that has been a great privilege. What I'm going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is, is move over to where the laptop is so that I can give you a few slides to accompany uh, this lecture uh, that I'm going to do. Can everybody hear me OK in the back? Is that all right? OK. Um, well, I'm here really to talk about George Kennan and to talk about the uh, long-term project of writing George Kennan's authorized uh, biography, a project which uh, began some 30 years ago um, when uh, I became Kennan's authorized biographer. He was uh, 78 years old at the time. We thought that this would mean that the biography, which was always assumed uh, to be a posthumous biography, would appear in about 10 years or so. But of course, George lived to be 101. Um, and so this delayed the biography for a considerable period of time. He regarded this as a grave personal failing on his part, <laughs> living as long as he did, and thereby delaying uh, the book. So as Jeremy knows very well, I would constantly get apologetic phone calls from George uh, uh, apologizing profusely for not dying so that the book could be published. Uh, and uh, this was a very strange relationship, I can tell you, which went on uh, for a long time. In many ways, however, it was an extraordinarily uh, rewarding and fruitful uh, relationship. And the writing of this book, which has preoccupied me for the last five years uh, or so, has been uh, the best writing experience in terms of uh, just the fun of writing history and biography that I have ever had. So uh, this is the cover. Uh, this is where it's available, various purveyors. Um, and there are a lot of possibilities as to what I could talk about uh, this afternoon with regard uh, to this book. It is 700 pages uh, covering 101 years. So 
I, I really should choose some theme. I could talk, for example, as we did this morning in Jeremy's class about Kennan and grand strategy, because with the idea of containment, George Kennan came closer than anyone else to having foreseen at the beginning of the Cold War, how the Cold War would end four decades later, and for setting the United States and its allies on the path that eventually brought about that result. Uh, this is George with the first policy planning staff in the State Department. Note the size of the policy planning staff uh, at, that, at that point. I can equally well talk about Kennan as containment's most severe critic. Uh, for so, no sooner had he convinced the Truman administration to embrace the course of containment than he began trying to reverse that course, fearing that the United States, in the act of seeking to contain the Soviet Union, had become the more dangerous nation. And he continued to have, hold that view of the United States as the dangerous nation throughout uh, much of the last part of his life. This is Kennan in one of his many uh, appearances before congressional committees uh, uh, testifying against US foreign policy, criticizing US foreign policy. I can talk about Kennan's illustrious career as one of the first Soviet specialists in the United States Foreign Service and how that career prepared him for his role as the first director of the policy planning staff and then as ambassador to the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. But I could equally, equally well explain how he saw himself as having failed miserably in the last three of those four roles. He would have seen himself as having been a successful career foreign service officer, but as a failure as policy planning staff director, as ambassador to the Soviet Union, as ambassador to Yugoslavia. This is a picture of George getting off the plane at Tempelhof in Berlin in 1952, where he's just about to make the statement, the unwise comparison to life in Moscow with life in Nazi Germany that got him kicked out of the Soviet Union. Uh, he was the only uh, ambassador or minister to Russia or the Soviet Union ever to have been expelled in the some 230 years of Russian-American relations. I could talk about Kennan's subsequent careers as historian, as early environmentalist, as a long-term uh, long anti-nuclear activist, as a constant critic of American culture, which he certainly was. But I could also talk about his teaching, his farming, his musicianship, um, and what I think should be his reputation uh, in the long run as one of the greatest American writers of the 20th century. I could talk about George's extraordinary diary, which he began keeping in the year 1916. It was about, uh, would have been uh, 11 years old, 12 years old at that point. Um, and continue to keep with gaps until the year 2003. Excerpts of which, but they will have to be only excerpts, uh, will soon be published under the editorship of P Professor Frank Castigliola from the University of Connecticut. This diary fills several thousand pages, most of them written out in longhand, a hand that did not even begin to become shaky until Kennan was in his mid-90s reflecting a mind that stayed clear until the last year of his life. This is a page from George's diary in the year 1999. Uh, that's uh, six years before he died. I can talk about what this diary reveals of his dreams, for he carefully chronicled dreams over many years, along with the contradictions that he saw in these dreams about himself. He was, for example, an insider who always felt himself to be on the outside. He was a patriot who loved his country but understood another country, Russia, much better than his own. He was an expert who saw his expertise as more often dismissed than drawn upon. He was an advisor who saw his advice taken when it was most casually given. He was an enthusiast for covert operations who came to want to abolish covert operations altogether. He was an alarmist about the Soviet Union, who became an apologist for the Soviet Union. He was a prophet who wound up being profoundly depressed by his own vindication. He was a faithful Christian 
who could not help but wonder whether it had not been Jesus who created God rather than the other way around. And while arguably the most famous grand strategist of his time, he was a man who would have much preferred to have been a biographer, the biographer of Anton Chekhov. So, if, as F. Scott Fitzgerald once wrote, the sign of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two contradictory ideas in the mind at the same time, then Kennan's must be one of the greatest minds of all time. Or I could talk about what it was like to be over these 30 years or so, uh, George Kennan's authorized biographer. Uh, I figured out the other day that I had been Kennan's Boswell longer than Boswell was Johnson's Boswell. And even there, there were contradictions uh, in the relationship. George once told me, I'm glad you're at Yale and not at Princeton, because that way you're not always around and underfoot. And indeed, I think that was a good arrangement for us to have. So if I were to try to talk about even half of these themes, we could be here not just all afternoon, but all week. Uh, there is a lot to say on every one of those points. So what I thought I would do today instead, uh, today, is just talk about one subject, which I think has not been widely enough talked about, and that, uh, but I think it's important. This is Kennan's relationship to the great books, because it seems to me that an underappreciated aspect of Kennan's grand strategy is the extent to which it was based on the great literary, political, and military classics that preceded the writing of the classics that he produced. Um, this is one of them, the famous article, The Sources of Soviet Conduct, from Foreign Affairs, July 1947, signed only by X. And the X was there because Kennan had just become the director of the policy planning staff under General Marshall, and General Marshall did not expect his advisors uh, to advertise themselves, and hence the anonymity here. But almost immediately, the anonymity was shattered, and within about two weeks, Time Magazine was designing a cover, which it wound up not using, but this is what it would have looked like uh, of George Kennan. And that is because it quickly became clear that this key article which obviously laid out what the United States strategy toward the Soviet Union was going to be, had indeed been written by George Kennan, the new director of the policy planning staff. Uh, how did that happen? How was his cover blown? Well, I asked his um, secretary about this, and she said, oh, it's very easy. Uh, nobody else but Mr. Kennan would have quoted Edward Gibbon in foreign affairs. And indeed, that was true. Kennan had written in the article that the Soviet leadership was finding it necessary, in Gibbon's phrase, to chastise the contumacy, the rebelliousness, that their own actions, both at home and abroad, had generated. But even more strikingly, the X article cited Thomas Mann's Buddenbrooks, his great novel as the basis for Kennan's famous prediction, which turned out to be correct, that the Soviet Union would, in time, destroy itself from within. Because like the Buddenbrooks family, a formidable external facade contained internal enfeeblement, and the enfeeblement was already well advanced, Kennan argued in 1947. So um, Kennan concluded from his reading of these great literary texts, Gibbon and Thomas Mann, uh, that Soviet power, like the capitalist world of its own conception, bears within itself the seeds of its decay, and the sprouting of these seeds is well advanced. And that was the basis for Kennan's argument that the United States could, as he wrote, enter with reasonable confidence upon a policy of firm containment designed to confront the Russians with unalterable counterforce at every point where they show signs of encroaching upon the interests of a peaceful and stable world. Now this big idea that the Soviet Union would in due course destroy itself 
I think was the single most important grand strategic insight of the Cold War. And it's one that was vindicated with eerie precision four and a half decades after Kennan put it forward in 1946 and 1947. So to see that far into the future, it seems to me, is remarkable. Even more so is the fact that it was Kennan's reading of these two great books, both written well before anybody had ever heard of the Soviet Union, that provided the basis for the prediction. I don't know when Kennan first read Thomas Mann, uh, but I suspect it was in the late 1920s when he was stationed in the Baltic States and in Weimar, Germany. He would, of course, have read it in the original German, which he uh, knew and spoke well because he'd been brought up in Milwaukee, uh, a German-American city. I do know because I asked Kennan about it when he found the time to read Edward Gibbon. Uh, and it turned out that it was on transatlantic airplane trips in World War II. These were long trips. The planes re required re refueling. They couldn't make it in a single uh, hop. Diplomats generally did not have priority on them, so they would be bumped from the flights somewhere in mid-Atlantic, for example. So it could take four or five days to get across the ocean by air in that uh, period. And because the planes were noisy, and it was impossible to talk, and it was difficult to sleep, the only solution was to bring along Edward Gibbon, who, with George Kennan, crossed the Atlantic something like seven or eight times during World War II. All of which then raises the question, if Kennan got insights that showed up in the X article from Gibbon and from Thomas Mann, uh, what grand strategic insights might he have drawn from other great literary or classical works? And if so, what were they? Uh, that's what I've been thinking about in the aftermath, really, of finishing uh, this book. Now, despite Kennan's reputation as a realist, whatever that means, in his approach to international relations. I found uh, no evidence, this really is kind of shocking for us in the Yale Grand Strategy Seminar, no evidence that Kennan ever read Thucydides or any of the other ancient Greek classics uh, in anything but the most casual way. And I never really got a chance to ask him about this. Maybe the Greeks were too democratic for him. Maybe the empire they ran was too small for him to be able to see connections to his own time, but it's clear that uh, uh, no real insights came from uh, Thucydides. Nor did Kennan show any interest in or ever try to gain access to the Chinese grand strategic tradition, uh, which uh, I know Jeremy uses uh, Sun Tzu and the Art of War in his class here. We use it at Yale. And this larger grand strategic tradition that comes out of China, not just Sun Tzu, has now been carefully uh, chronicled, carefully analyzed by another great American grand strategist, Henry Kissinger, in his uh, extraordinary book on China, which came out uh, last summer. It's true that Kennan uh, did anticipate one important aspect of what was going to happen in China in the post-war period, the development of the Sino-Soviet split. But this was uh, really an insight that he got from his great friend John Peyton Davies, who was the East Asian expert on the policy planning staff. It was not a reflection of any expertise that Kennan himself had on China. However, if uh, Kennan did not draw from Thucydides or from uh, Sun Tzu, he certainly did draw on Clausewitz. Kennan never read Clausewitz's On War as carefully as he did the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And I'm inclined to think that this is a good thing, because as I tell, uh, tell the Yale Grand Strategy students, to try to do a close reading of Clausewitz's incomplete and unwieldy classic written in German, so that it takes so long to get to the verbs that you don't know what the sentence is going to be about in the first place, and it's very, very, you try to do a close reading of On War, you will go bonkers. Uh, you just can't do it. It's a contradictory, incomplete uh, text. So you have to back off. You have to look at the major points that Clausewitz was trying to make. And indeed, Kennan was lucky because he was able to do this uh, in the summer of 1946 when he was brought home to design the first grand strategy curriculum anywhere in this country 
at the National War College, newly established in 1946. Kennan had to do crash reading on Clausewitz and other great-grand strategists. And he was able to do this uh, by way of an elegant summary of Clausewitz prepared by the German immigrant historian Hans Rothfels, which appeared in uh, the enormously influential collection of essays edited by Edward Mead Earle, Makers of Modern Strategy, published in 1943 in which some of the best historians in the country considered how the classical grand strategists could prepare the American grand strategists for whatever role they were going to play, which obviously was going to be a big one in the post-World War II world. And unlike many of Clausewitz's interpreters over the years, Rothfeld's got Clausewitz right, and it was through him that Kennan got Clausewitz during this critical crash reading summer in Washington, setting up the curriculum at the National War College in 1946. Now, what did Kennan take from Clausewitz? I think it was three big things, and they come pretty close to the three big things, although I have one or two others that I uh, really expect my students to get out of Clausewitz. First, of course, was the now familiar Clausewitzian concept that war must be the policy, uh, the continuation of policy by other means. War cannot be conducted separately from or independently of uh, political considerations. Now, this idea was for many Americans a new idea at the time. They had been preferred, uh, been brought up to think of war as something separate from politics. They preferred to think of it in that way. They preferred to think of it as something to be pursued as vigorously as possible to the point of victory, at which point, but only at that point, the politicians would take over from the generals. The best example of this kind of thinking was the call for unconditional surrender uh, of Germany and Japan in World War II, an idea that Kennan thought was crazy because the resulting power vacuum would only pave the way for the domination of Eurasia by the Soviet Union, uh, a wartime ally that Kennan was sure would become a post-war adversary. But Kennan found in Clausewitz very strong support for the argument that he had been making that unconditional surrender uh, did not make sense. The argument that he had been making in many of his wartime dispatches and in the February 1946 long telegram that the Soviet Union itself made no distinction between war and politics and that if the United States was going to deal realistically with the Soviet Union in the post-war period, it would have to learn to do the same, to do war and politics at the same time. So that's point one that Kennan got from Clausewitz. Point two was the idea that the purpose of military operations was not to produce as much violence as possible, but only enough to make a psychological impression on the mind of the adversary, a psychological impression sufficiently powerful that it would cause the adversary himself to choose to stop doing whatever it was that you objected to his doing. Um, and here Clausewitz was restating the very old idea of proportionality, which can be traced back through the American founding fathers to Machiavelli, to St. Augustine, and ultimately to Sun Tzu himself. It was Sun Tzu who said, the best kind of war is the one that you don't have to do any fighting in. You just persuade the adversary to stop. This idea resonated with Kennan as it did with many others, not only because of the disproportionate effects of strategic bombing in World War II, which they had witnessed, but also because of the far greater violence that would now be possible if future wars were fought with atomic weapons. So that was the second point, proportionality, that Kennan took from Clausewitz. Third, Kennan was impressed by what Clausewitz had written about the virtues of defense over offense, that every offensive in time exhausts itself. It reaches what Clausewitz called a culminating point, a center of gravity, at which a minimal application of opposing force uh, can reverse the offensive. The offensive has simply overextended itself 
and therefore it's vulnerable. So you just have to wait patiently, like General Kutuzov during Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812, for that opportunity to happen. Now that's what I think Kennan got from Clausewitz. How does it all relate to what Kennan himself devised within the, the strategy of containment? Well, it seems to me that Kennan's reading of Gibbon had convinced him that the Soviet Union had overextended itself by projecting its power, whether by territorial acquisitions or by the creation of spheres of influence, into the center of Europe at the end of World War II. For as Gibbon had pointed out in The Decline and Fall, there was nothing more difficult than to attempt to hold conquered provinces indefinitely against the will of their inhabitants. Conquered provinces could only be sources of weakness and not strength. Stalin, <coughs> then, in Kennan's view, had followed the tradition of the overextended Romans and certainly of Napoleon. Stalin's taking control of half of Europe at the end of World War II was like Napoleon's taking of Moscow in 1812, or like Hitler's conquest of much of European Russia, if not Moscow, in 1941-42. All of them, the Romans, Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin, had failed to answer one of the most important questions in grand strategy, which is, having got what you want, what do you do next? In a situation like this, a small push applied at just the right moment with carefully chosen means can reverse the momentum and can gradually force the invaders retreat at relatively little cost to oneself. And all the better if this can be done according to the Sun Tzu standard with no fighting at all. Well, Kennan's instrument of reversal, it seems to me, turned out to be the Marshall Plan of 1947 which was intended precisely to produce a psychological effect in the minds of the Europeans and of Stalin as well, to convince them that Europe's future need not be communism under Soviet domination. The Marshall Plan was in this sense a Kutuzov-like maneuver and Stalin never recovered his equilibrium, uh, his balance from this. Clausewitz, of course, um, had served in the Russian army in 1812. And Clausewitz even makes a cameo appearance in Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. If you get to page 770-something of the current new edition, suddenly at the Battle of Borodino, uh, Clausewitz comes riding by. Um, Kennan, of course, knew Tolstoy very well, as he knew the other great works of pre-revolutionary Russian literature. Indeed, it was through them that he had largely educated himself as a young foreign service officer about the post-revolutionary uh, Soviet Union. But how was it exactly that writers like uh, Tolstoy or Pushkin or Turgenev or Gogol or Dostoevsky or especially his favorite Chekhov shaped Kennan's grand strategy in the Cold War? What's the connection between these things? Well, I think these texts, these great novels, these great plays, these great stories, provided a window for Kennan into the Russian national character. He would have said it was a window into the Russian soul. And what he saw was that the Soviet Union, for all of its power and pretensions, was an aberration. It was a temporary uh, phenomenon. It would not last. And one of the best illustrations of this came in a curious way when in June of 1945, stationed in Moscow, George Kennan decided to send himself to Siberia. Now he did this uh, partly because of the connection to his ancestor, the first George Kennan, 1845 to 1924, who had explored Siberia, the greatest American explorer of Siberia and who had written the uh, epic and influential uh, work, Siberia and the Exile System, which was published in 1891, and really defined in the minds of Americans the image of Siberia as a great prison of peoples. You see here a photograph 
of the first George Kennan, uh, who was on the lecture circuit constantly in the United States. And he would lecture in convict garb, as you see him here, with chains attached, which he would clank uh, in accompaniment to his lecture. He was a rock star of his own age uh, in the thousands of lectures that he gave around America. Um, the second George Kennan. Uh, had only met the old man once. The, sides, the two sides of the family were not close, but obviously the second canon patterned his uh, decision to go into Russian studies on the example of his great uh, ancestor. And he had never been to Siberia, the second canon. And so when given the opportunity at the end of the war, he got permission from the authorities at least to go out as far as Novosibirsk. And he went out by train. It took something like five days uh, in those days to go. And he um, investigated collective farms, industrial facilities, and whatnot. Here's a snapshot of Kennett on a collective farm uh, with peasants and with uh, somebody from the police uh, very, very closely supervising him. This is Stalin's Russia, uh, of course. Kennan returned from Novosibirsk by air. And that trip in itself required some three days, uh, several stops, and a lot of improvisation along the way. And on the flight from Novosibirsk to Omsk, uh, Kennan was seated next to an illiterate old woman a babushka, who charmed him, regaled him with observations on life, reflecting, as he wrote in his diary, all the pungency and charm of the mental world of those who had never known the printed word. And so when they got to Omsk, it was a hot day, and they had lunch out on the tarmac under the shade of one of the wings of the plane. And Kennan pulled out his copy of Tolstoy, I don't know which Tolstoy, but it doesn't matter, and began reading Tolstoy aloud to the babushka in his wonderfully uh, uh, elegant 19th century aristocratic Russian, which is the way he had learned Russian. And the babushka, as you would expect, was thrilled. But so were all the other passengers on the plane. Every passenger on the plane surrounded them and listened to Kennan reading Tolstoy aloud. Now that's June 1945. Arguably, it's the high point of Soviet power, the Soviets having won the war. And yet, this tells you something about the deeply, deeply rooted Russian national character. It tells you something very different from Marxist-Leninist ideology. And I think it was an, a very meaningful moment uh, for Kennan, confirming his view that there was something much deeper than Soviet ideology that was in this country. That somehow Tolstoy himself, uh, from the distant past, put, could be a guide to the Russian future. This is Tolstoy with some kids uh, late in life talking, no doubt, about the Russian future. And then on top of all of this, there is the first university lecture that George Kennan ever gave, as far as I can tell. And it took place, I'm pleased to say, on the uh, 1st of October, 1946, at Yale University. Uh, the chief target of Kennan's lecture on that day was the former Vice President of the United States, Henry Wallace, who had just been sacked from President Truman's cabinet for insisting that the only choices available to the United States in its relationship with the Soviet Union in the post-war period were two the possibility of conciliation or appeasement on the one hand, and then if you didn't go that route, the only choice then was going to be a third world war. Only two choices, war or appeasement. Kennan thought that was wrong. He knew it was wrong. And to explain why, this is what he devoted his Yale lecture to, an attack on Henry Wallace. And particularly to drive home his point he devoted the last fourth of his Yale lecture. I think this must somewhat have puzzled the Yaleys. Kennan devoted the last fourth of his lecture to a short story by Anton Chekhov. This is his speaking text uh, for the Yale lecture. And the single spaced passages are quotations from Chekhov's story. Um, the story is called The New Villa. And it's about the well-meaning owner 
of an estate who has tried to befriend its peasants in order to reform their lives, but has gotten nowhere with them. This is a persistent theme in Russian literature in the 19th century. The owner of the estate walks away sadly, but she is followed by a sympathetic blacksmith. Uh, and the blacksmith says, don't be offended, mistress. Wait a couple of years, and you can have the school, and you can have the roads, but not all at once. If you want to sow grain on that hill, you first have to clear it, and then you have to take all the stones off, and then you have to plow it up, and then you have to keep after it and keep after it. And it's just the same with people. You have to keep after them and keep after them until you win them over. And I think Kennan was using this point uh, with the Yaleys to make an important point, because he was suggesting that people could reshape even the most tyrannical governments, but that this would take time. It could not be done overnight. And circumstance is not Henry Wallace-like sentimentality. Indeed, would over time shape people. And it seems to me therein lay the key to what American grand strategy uh, would be, the strategy of containment, to create the circumstances over time that would leave the leaders of the Soviet Union with no choice but to reshape their country patiently and non-provocatively to keep after them and keep after them until you won them over. So when Kennan gave this lecture at Yale in the fall of 1946, Mikhail Gorbachev was 15 years old. It would be another 39 years uh, before Gorbachev came to power. But it is as if Kennan saw him coming before even Gorbachev saw himself coming. And Kennan did this by drawing on an image, really a metaphor, from the Russian writer he most admired, whose biographer he someday wanted to be. So why then this affinity for Chekhov? that's reflected so clearly and so persistently throughout Kennan's life. I think it may have been connected to the death of his mother. George Kennan's mother died two months after he was born in 1904 of uh, circumstances unrelated to the birth. It was simply appendicitis. Uh, but he was left at the age of two months uh, without a mother. And this affected him throughout his life. Um, Florence James Kennan died uh, in uh, April of 1904. Anton Chekhov died in July of uh, 1904. So I think that may be uh, a connection uh, as well. But then there is another experience, which is the kind of experience that only biographers who are privileged to know their subject personally uh, could have had. It's not the kind of thing that shows up in the archives. But it happened in 1999. Uh, my wife, Tony, who's sitting back there in the middle, uh, about halfway up, wave, Tony. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and I went to see uh, George and Annalisa Kennan in Princeton. And um, he looked like this, roughly, at that time. And Tony, at that point, Tony runs the undergraduate theater program at Yale and was, at that point, preparing uh, to direct a group of undergraduates in a production of The Cherry Orchard. And so she and George got into a conversation on Chekhov. I was just a bystander you know, taking this in with two Chekhov experts uh, comparing notes with each other. But somehow George got off on another Chekhov uh, short story, which is called The Step. And it's a story about a little boy who is uh, leaving home uh, on an ox cart uh, driven by peasants. And the little boy is riding on a great pile of hay. And he is riding across the great Russian steppe. And there are no visible signs to be seen other than just this empty space and the huge sky above. And at night, because the trip goes on for several days, at night the stars, the cold stars above. And the little boy feels lost. He does not know where he's going. He does not know uh, what's going to happen to him. And as George, uh, in the year uh, 1999, began telling us uh, this story, the tears just began pouring down his cheeks. And so that's why I think I have some confidence in saying that the connection to Chekhov 
is connected in some way to the loss of George's own mother um, almost a century before the time that we went to see him. Maybe it was also something to do with Chekhov's self-control. He is the most self-controlled of all of the great Russian writers. You get the impression when you read a short story or see a play by Chekhov at first that nothing is happening, but then you realize that a great deal is happening uh, beneath uh, the surface. So Chekhov's ability in his plays and stories to say a lot with a little, I think appealed to George, for whom self-control was always uh, very important. Maybe it actually had something to do with the idea of containment itself. Self-containment and national containment and Soviet containment always were common themes uh, with George Kennan. Maybe it was the experience of the Kennans buying a farm just outside of the curiously named uh, village of East Berlin, Pennsylvania, uh, it had that name before the other place was East Berlin, and it continues now to have that name to the present day. But in 1942, coming back from internment in Nazi Germany, the Kennans uh, were looking for a farm. They found one, 238 acres just outside Gettysburg at the town of uh, East Berlin. Um, it was, uh, the price was $14,000. And it was well beyond their means. One of the things that people don't realize about uh, the Kennans was that they had no money. They lost their money in the Great Depression. And so they were no, in no way part of the wealthy East Coast establishment. But on that occasion, Annalisa turned to George and said, George, we have to buy it because the house looks like the house in the cherry orchard. And so, of course, they had to buy it. Anton Chekhov told them that they had to buy it. There was, as it happened, only one cherry tree on the property. But on that first night, George made a point, of, on that first evening, George made a point of climbing that cherry tree and surveying his 238 acres from that lofty site. So there was a connection there. And they, for years, called the place uh, the cherry orchard. But I like to think that the Chekhov connection had something even more to do with another house that is halfway around the world at a place called Yalta, which was the last house in which Chekhov lived. Completed in 1898, it looked uh, like this um, at the time that Chekhov lived there. It's Chekhov's white dacha in Yalta. Chekhov knew at the time that he bought this house, he was, after all, a doctor, that he was dying of tuberculosis. He had known this for some 15 years before this happened. But Chekhov used a great deal of his time in Yalta to plant a garden, a garden that he knew he would never see in full bloom. And this is a photograph, a rather fuzzy, fuzzy photograph of Chekhov in his garden at Yalta. It's March 1904. It's one month after George Kennan is born. It's about uh, three months uh, or four months before Chekhov's own death. You can see the height of the plants. They have had to be staked up at this point. And down in the bottom of the screen, you can see very curiously something that looks like a bird, something that looks like a crane. And in fact, it is a crane. Uh, Chekhov had a friendly wild crane who would fly into Yalta every summer and would visit Chekhov. The crane appreciated Russian literature and liked to spend time with Chekhov. And it would come and fly in, and then it would fly away to parts unknown. But it was fond enough uh, of Chekhov that it would walk with him through the garden as they inspected the young growing plants. Um, now, uh, Tony and I had the privilege of being in Yalta on the L alumni trip last summer. And this is what the garden looks like now. I like to think it's what Chekhov would have wanted it to look like. This is the garden today. Now, what does all of this have to do with Kennan's 1946 talk at Yale, or with the larger grand strategy of containment that he was developing uh, at that time? Well, here's something that Kennan wrote a few years later, and he repeated this basic idea on many occasions. He wrote, we must be gardeners and not mechanics in our approach to world affairs. International life, he wrote, was an organic process, not a static system. 
Americans had inherited the system, but they had not designed it. Their preferred standards of behavior therefore could hardly govern it, but it should be possible, quote, to take those forces for what they are and to induce them to work with us and for us by influencing the environmental stimuli to which they are uh, subjected. And this would have to be done gently and patiently with understanding and sympathy, not trying to force growth by mechanical means, not tearing up the plants by the roots when they fail to behave as we wish them to. The forces of nature will generally be on the side of him who understands them best and respects them most scrupulously. So more than anyone else, ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me that um, it was George Kennan who showed in the mid-1940s that one need not resort to either war or appeasement in dealing with the challenge posed by the Soviet Union, that with patience there could be another way. I think Kennan would have been the first to admit that he himself was not always patient, that he did not always or even very often practice this quality that he preached, hence his multiple contradictions which so often exas exasperated his contemporaries even as they have fascinated his biographer. But still, on the whole, Kennan was right. He lived to see the seeds he planted in the 1940s, however precariously uh, vindicate him. And Chekhov was not as fortunate. Chekhov did not live to see the seeds he planted at Yalta over 100 years ago grow into the great garden that delights visitors to his dacha today. But I like to think that one or two of the seeds that Chekhov planted so long ago took root in the mind of his failed biographer, George Kennan, with the result that in some mystical way, the two of them collaborated with surprising success in the saving of Western civilization. Thank you very much. I think John will take questions, right, John? Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think I'll disconnect this. John, do you want to call people, or do you want me to? Call um, them? I'll do it. Okay. Thanks, Jeremy. There we are. <laughs> I was giving a talk at Princeton the other day and tried to cut off the computer, and all it did was just show my email correspondence for the last uh, five days or so. So questions? I have a question. Yes. After the fall of the wall in the Soviet Union, we had a wonderful opportunity to go to Russia and help them with their infrastructure, uh, whatever they needed, tax, their tax situation. They had vast resources, oil, gas, oil, you name it, they've got it, and it's a huge country. And yet now we're over in the Middle East trying to, I guess we went there for, oil, for gas and oil. Why didn't we develop a better relationship with the Soviet Union? Because there was that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, that is, I know that that's an issue that worried George Kennan um, quite a lot. It's one of the reasons he was so adamantly opposed to the expansion of NATO after the Cold War ended, because he believed that there was an opportunity to build the kind of relationship that you were talking about with uh, the Soviet Union. But George was always very careful in what he said about this. He said the possibilities do not include the, the possibility that the Russians would ever become like us. He never really thought that democracy would transplant to uh, the Soviet Union. But he said it would be possible, it should be possible for the Soviet Union to evolve from a revolutionary state into a normal state. And that is what he hoped would happen. Uh, the process, it does seem to me, was uh, ill-conceived. It was bumpy. It was imperfect. There was an oscillation between just rampant, uncontrolled capitalism in the first uh, decade, the 1990s, the era of uh, Yeltsin. Uh, the Americans going back and forth, particularly Bill Clinton going back and forth over whether we wanted to be friends with Russia or whether we were uh, building NATO uh, against them in some way. Uh, things have settled down in the last decade or so under Putin. Putin would not have surprised or horrified uh, George Kennan because he would have said that this is what the Russians would expect, would be a, a strong leader, not a Democrat. 
Uh, so I think uh, I know that he was, while living, very critical of our policy toward post-Cold War Russia for this reason, very critical of the expansion of uh, NATO, uh, and how he would feel at this point about the prospect of having Putin as the president of Russia uh, through uh, the end of the, of the uh, 21st century, 100 years from now. I'm not quite sure, uh, but Putin would not have surprised him. Yes? Um, James Galbraith, and thank you very much for a very eloquent talk. I Thanks. have to say, prefacing my question, that my grandfather on my mother's side who arranged for the publication of the first complete edition of Tolstoy's work. Uh, terrific. Great. I didn't know that. Uh, as you framed your presentation mm -hmm. channeling mm -hmm. and for us as a rejection of the choice between appeasement mm -hmm. and war, I, I can't help but think of the current crisis brewing over Iran. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you think Kennan would have projected the lessons that he mm -hmm. developed with respect to the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Well, we were talking about that to some extent in Jeremy's um, seminar this morning. The question comes up uh, frequently. I try to be careful uh, precisely not to channel uh, George Kennan uh, because um, I think that uh, uh, context is everything. And uh, for me to try to say what George would have thought about what we should do about Iran. Uh, is presumptuous uh, on my part. I think the best we can do is to look to George's writings very much in the same way that we look to the other great classical texts for uh, what we might call the transferable principles that might be sufficiently general but nonetheless sufficiently useful that they could apply to uh, multiple situations. And I think there's one in particular that probably applies here and this is George's uh, search for sensitivity to the internal contradictions that exist within other societies. He saw as early as the 1930s what he would have called the central internal contradiction of the Soviet Union, which is that Marxism-Leninism simply did not fit the, the Russian people. And then this contradiction was uh, exacerbated by another, which was the Soviet Union becoming um, um, uh, an overstretched empire, a second uh, contradiction as well. And so there was always, in his thinking about Russia, this idea that countries can defeat themselves from within um, as a result of uh, these, uh, these failures, these contradictions. And from the outside, sometimes you can uh, hurry the process along, uh, sometimes you cannot. But for the most part, you have to let these contradictions take their own course. And sometimes that works, as it did with the Soviet Union. He would have been the first to say that it would not have worked with Nazi Germany, because Hitler was on a rigid timetable and was going to proceed without regard to whatever contradictions existed in German society. So it seems to me the issue for Iran right now and for thinking about Iran is just this. How much time is there? There certainly are contradictions, as we know within that uh, society, profound contradictions. It is not what you would call a healthy, self-confident society. Uh, but how much time do we have uh, for those contradictions to manifest themselves as against the danger of uh, Iran acquiring uh, a nuclear weapon? Uh, that's one of the great imponderables. And then, of course, the second question is uh, what happens if or when they do? How much would that actually change? And again, as you know very well, there's a lot of debate over just that. So I think he would tell us, first of all, to try to be sensitive to the internal contradictions in Iranian society, not to try to impose on the Iranians uh, our own views on this, our own system, uh, not to expect them to become Democrats. Um, and then he would ask us, it seems to me, to think through what the actual implications would be if they get a nuclear weapon. It's like the question that I was asking in the lecture. The great point of grand strategy is always to know what do you actually do when you get what you want? Well, that's a really good question to ask of the Iranians. What would they do if they had one in the first place? A lot of other people have developed them, uh, and it was considered a great uh, disaster when they did even to the point of when the Chinese were on the verge of acquiring theirs, the existence of a secret Soviet American 
plot to preempt and take out the Chinese nuclear facilities. And this was the Soviet Union and the United States plotting this kind of thing. And yet China behaved as a very normal state, having got the bomb. So the question is, how far uh, does that trend extend? Uh, obviously, sooner or later, somebody is going to get the bomb and go completely bonkers. But when does that happen? And is that likely in this case? These are the questions he would throw at us. They don't have easy answers. There are no formulas here. Uh, but I think he would ask us to think along these lines. Yeah, Frank. Uh, thank you for a terrific presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm really fascinated by the arrangement you had in terms of writing a book. And I was mm -hmm. thinking, and I'm sure you reflected upon this, what would it have been like, how would the book have been different if you had had the opportunity to write it, say, in 1985, uh -huh. while the Cold War was still going on, yeah. or 1995, when U.S.-Russian mm -hmm. relations were different. And mm -hmm. How did you think about that process? Mm -hmm. And you know, do you ever wonder what the book might have looked like? Sure. After? Question, if you couldn't hear it, is how would the book have been different if I had actually written it or been able to write it? Uh, say George had died at age uh, 80 or so instead of 101, uh, at um, a considerably earlier stage um, in, uh, in this process. I, I have thought about that. Um, I think it probably was good for me that it took long enough and that I did a lot of other things in between. Uh, one benefit for me was, uh, after moving to Yale 15 years ago, to teach every spring uh, a junior seminar called The Art of Biography, in which we just talk about what makes a good biography and what makes a bad biography. And I learned an immense amount uh, from those students, just going over those questions uh, with them. So I think uh, even though this is the first biography I have actually written, I feel like I know something about biography just from having taught that, that subject uh, to, to bright students. So that's part of it. Um, I think I'm, in fact, I'm pretty sure that I have wound up being more critical of him than I would have been when younger. I think I have more sympathy for the exasperations of the people that he had to work with because I occasionally get, I've had more time to get exasperated with the people I have to work with. And maybe that's why this works. Uh, and so I think I'm uh, more critical than I would have been if I'd written it when I was younger. I probably would have been more deferential or respectful. But on the other hand, uh, I know that he expected a critical biography. Uh, we talked about this early on, and we talked about the difference between hagiography and biography. And he made it very clear that what he wanted was a tough, critical uh, biography. And very significantly, he left the um, sources for this behind. Uh, so his diaries are themselves uh, uh, unsanitized. There's no evidence that he burned anything uh, from his diaries. They contain unflattering material, some sensitive uh, material. It's all there. And I think uh, it would not all be there if he had not wanted his biographer and other biographers to come uh, to see these uh, things and to wrestle with their, their implications. So that's my basic answer, Frank. I'm, I'm glad that, well, first of all, I'm glad that I lived to complete it because this was a, an effort. I don't know whether Jeremy ever participated in one of these betting pools or not, but I know that other students were participating in betting pools as to which of us, Kenan or me, would go first. Uh, so I'm glad that I got the opportunity to write it. Uh, but I think it probably was a good thing that it was so long in the works. And I think the timing of it, um, though not planned, has been good in the sense that um, Enough time has passed since his death, now six years, uh, that a lot of people have begun to forget who he was, particularly younger people, and it's a good time for people to be reminded of um, who he was. Uh, so I'm happy that there was a certain period that uh, intervened between his death and the publication of the book. Yes? Has the book been reviewed in, in Russia? And, and I guess the larger question is, what is the Russian policymaking opinion on Kennan's trajectory of I honestly don't know whether there have been any reviews in Russia yet. The book came out in November, so it may be a little bit early. There is some talk about a Russian language translation, so how many uh, English language books uh, wind up being reviewed in Russia uh, in the, of this kind, uh, I don't know. Uh, as far as the Russians' own view of Kennan is concerned, um, it's um, pretty interesting because when George first went to Moscow with Bill Bullitt to set up the American embassy in 1933, the Russians felt like they immediately that they knew who he was 
and this was the top leadership, and it was because of the first charge cannon, and it was because the Bolsheviks themselves, uh, many of them had sir, uh, been imprisoned in Siberia. So for them, George Cannon, the name George Cannon was a heroic name, and they could never quite figure out just what the relationship was, but you know, it's the nephew, or it's the cousin, or the son, or whatever. So he started from a good starting point. His Russian was extraordinarily good, even at that point, and they appreciated that uh, as well. Uh, but as time went on, uh, and as espionage proceeded, uh, they gained a clearer sense of the extent to which uh, his views of the Soviet Union were critical. Uh, and so, as early as 1938, there is a Kennan dispatch, a top secret Kennan dispatch written while back in Washington, but it winds up on Stalin's desk. Uh, and it's very critical of uh, Stalin and the purges. And Stalin reads it very carefully and underlines it and so on and so forth. So it was clear that he was taking note of who Kennan was as early as, as that point. In the wartime period when he's back, the relationship is more cordial as you would expect uh, during the wartime period. But of course, when the long telegram uh, is uh, uh, sent, that is a top secret document, which also did not remain top secret at all from the Russians. It was passed around enough so that the Russians had a copy of it very quickly. And we know this because uh, the uh, Soviet ambassador in Washington, uh, Mr. Novikov, was immediately ordered by Molotov to provide a long telegram of his own like the one that Kennan had written. This is, in the, this is in September of 40, just a few months afterwards, you know, which he does. It's a real turkey of a document, but nonetheless, there it is. Uh, and so um, we know that uh, the, by the time Kennan had become a public figure, uh, he was a public figure in the context of being very much anti-Soviet. Now, why the Russians agreed to have him come as ambassador in 1952 is a puzzle still, uh, but they did. But it's also very clear that as soon as he arrived, they were trying to compromise him and find an excuse to kick him out. And so the story of his brief Moscow ambassadorship of only about five months is a hair-raising, spooky Cold War story uh, for sure, uh, because they really were uh, trying to compromise him in one form uh, or another. After that, uh, after the death of Stalin, uh, Russian diplomats would come around to Princeton, where he was living by then, uh, frequently, uh, generally with bottles of uh, brandy, Georgian brandy, uh, in hand, saying, why don't you ever visit the Soviet Union, Ambassador Kennan? And he would say, well, because you kicked me out, you know, and so on. And it was kind of a mutual negotiation here that went on until about 64, when he did go back for the first time and was received as a hero, as uh, a great friend of the, uh, of the Soviet Union. And that, uh, for the most part, was uh, the situation uh, through the rest of the Cold War. And indeed, as he became more critical of the United States, he became uh, certainly more uh, well-regarded uh, in Moscow. So the couple of times that I was there with him in the 1980s, he was received like royalty, as, as you could expect. Um, the greatest moment in his life, he would have said, came when Gorbachev did his first uh, visit to the United States in December of 1987. And at the great reception at the Soviet Embassy in Washington, Gorbachev sees Kennan across a crowded room, crowded with all kinds of dignitaries, movie stars, whatnot, and rushes over and embraces him like this and says to him uh, in Russian, um, Mr. Kennan, we in our country uh, know uh, that a, a person can be a loyal patriot to his own country and still be a friend of ours, and that is how we regard you. Uh, Gorbachev was the first Soviet leader that he had met since Stalin. So that was a really great um, moment. But that's also the moment uh, of uh, a kind of cultural gap moment. Uh, that's the occasion on which uh, at the uh, tables while Gorbachev was seated, I, while uh, Kennan was seated while Gorbachev was speaking, he was seated next to an extraordinary lady with long fingernails, smoking Danish cigars, who George was told was the widow of a uh, famous rock star whose name was something like Lenin. And George, <laughs> how could she have known Lenin? She looks much too young to have known Lenin. <laughs> uh, 
And it had to be explained to him later by his secretaries that this was Yoko Ono, you know, so. <laughs> so there we are. I think there's probably no better moment to... I think it's always a good time to end a lecture when Yoko Ono comes up. <laughs> and uh, John will be signing books in the back. There is a table where there, there will be books for sale, mm -hmm. so uh, we want to give him time. But please join me in thanking him.